Welcome to a uh, presentation on C++ and quantitative finance. Um, I don't want to bore you too much, but just a little bit about myself. I'm now starting my fourth year as a full-time instructor in the um, computational finance and risk management program at the University of Washington. It's a uh, terminal master's program, um, and we also place our students in internships and employment. So. Um, it's not just the, the degree, but we actually, uh, um, um, we are also rated on our placement rate. Um, then, um, okay, before that, I spent about 24 years in the finance field, um, mostly in quantitative development, and I got my first start with um, C++ in about 1998. So. Um, of course, some of you also remember way back when, when we didn't have some of this nice stuff. So, okay, so um, what we're going to talk about, um, first, uh, we're going to focus more on the needs of end users, and what I mean by that are quants who usually use interpreted languages to um, develop models, uh, such as VBA or MATLAB, uh, Python, and um, you know, they end up staying at, at the office until 9.30 at night waiting for their programs to run. Or the other case you'd hear about is, uh, you know, someone would have a model in MATLAB that would, I'm not kidding, take two to three days. And then someone would come along and code it up in C++ and it would run in about under five minutes on a standard desktop. So um, I think what I'm going to talk about today in C++ in general would appeal to people like that. And also include people who um, build financial libraries. So things like option pricing models, um, risk management models, that sort of thing. And that's kind of what I did in the, after I got into C++ programming. So um, also we're going to, one thing, this presentation is not complicated at all. Um, the, the theme really is easy to use, and then, but uh, we're going to get some powerful results out of that. And uh, in other words, uh, tools in C++ that we can leverage. Now, I know leverage is kind of a cliche term, right? But it really rings true here in that we can think of um, the abstractions and new features in C++ that are like the torque around, along the right there. And so it takes less effort to lift a, a heavier load. But um, I think more accurately, it looks something like that. So the idea is um, we want to let C++ do the driving as much as we can, kind of like Greyhound, but a lot faster. OK. So um, at the end of the last decade, we really started to see the start of something beautiful. And um, C++ was soon to follow. Um, thank you, John Kelb, for a good book. I assigned that book to my students uh, first day of the term, and um, I have them read the whole book. But um, we'll talk about math features coming up, but um, also we got move semantics, and along with that, unique pointer. and. Um, these actually helped make our uh, make models code more not just more efficient, but more maintainable, uh, more readable, and also the development time was was more rapid. And I actually went back to some of the stuff that I worked on in the in the previous decade, and I used some of these these new methods, and uh, it really does make a difference. Um, I could talk about that one topic for another hour, but um, don't worry. Uh, maybe another time though. Um, and then we also got parallel STL algorithms in C++17, everybody knows that. But um, if there ever was an epitome for leverage, it's, it's those. I mean, you just add one parameter to an algorithm and you can just reap incredibly, incredible efficiency gains. Okay. Um, the other thing that happened was um, better availability of um, decent open source math libraries. And um, for example, uh, you may have heard of Eigen and Armadillo. These are both quite popular in, in finance. Um, and they don't just include 
um, matrices, vectors, and the, the basic operations. They also include a lot of advanced decompositions, which are, um, which are necessary for a lot of financial modeling. Um, more recently, I've just only now heard about these, these new uh, libraries here. Uh, not tried them, um, but if they can do what they claim to do, that would also be really great. And um, then we have coming attractions. We're finally going to get a date class in C++20. I know that there are other things like concepts and modules people are really, and understandably so, gaga about. But for quant developers, having a proper date class finally is really, really great because dates are so important in finance. Um, and you know, this was yet another example of something that we would often have to program ourselves. Well, now we, we're finally going to get one. And also, as we speak, um, the SG14 group is meeting and discussing putting linear algebra into probably C++23. So um, that will also be a, a welcome, uh, welcome improvement. Um, a few things about Boost. Um, there are some things in there that are very intuitive and very useful. Um, but uh, to put it politely, um, there are some other things in there that could be a lot more user friendly. But we'll talk about a few things under the, the first category toward the end of this presentation. Okay, so what I want to do is demonstrate, I, I realize C11 is no longer that new. But what I want to do is look at an example. This is very typical in quant finance of having a model, um, uh, develop a model for an options price. And to be honest, I haven't, we've got all this great stuff even in C11, but I'm not seeing it in, um, in uh, other curricula, in textbooks. Um, it, you know, I was doing my little Rodney Dangerfield thing at the beginning there. I mean, it's like it gets no respect. But um, I want to show how we can use these things. And they're also very easy to, easy to use to apply to a very common problem in, in finance. So um, we will just take the easy case of a Monte Carlo option. But um, what we do here could be applied to much more complex options. Okay. So um, in case you don't know what an option is and a European option is, um, it's a tradable contract that gives the holder the right to buy or sell a share of stock at a predetermined strike price in the future and more specifically for, um, for uh, European options at the expiration date. Other types of options like American options, Bermudan options you can exercise before the option expires. But even though you can't exercise until um, the option expires, that option has value. So the options themselves, as many of you know, are traded. So we want to find a price for an option at the present time, even though the, the payoffs won't be until the future. So um, to get this set up, what we, what we need are um, since we, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, um, well, we don't have that, but what we can do is project stock prices into the future using random scenarios. Um, and so, um, oh, I'm sorry, to illustrate that, here are just five scenarios. Don't worry yet how it's done. So we, we have five of them. Um, you can see down here uh, toward the left, um, the current price at t equals zero is $100 a share. Now, suppose that um, we buy a call option with a strike price of 105. So at expiration, let's look at what happens. Um, if we look at the blue scenario, we see it, um, the strike price is about $120. So that means we could buy the we could we have the right to buy the stock at 105, and then we can turn around and sell it at 120 and make a $15 share profit. Okay, um, but that's in the future. But what we what we will need for our pricing model is we have to discount it back to today. So what happens is we discount it all the way back using a discount factor based on the current interest rate. Okay. Now what happens if it 
if the um, terminal stock price is below the, the strike? Well, in that case, the option expires worthless because it makes no sense. You're not going to um, pay 105 and sell it for less than, you know, sell it for 100. Um, unless you're the US government. But, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I had to go there. Um, but we have to um, discount that back as well, trivially to zero. So, um, and then it would be the same for the other payoffs, just whatever you, um, whatever you get. So this sets up the model. Now, how do we use these to price the, uh, to price the option? Um, well, suppose that the risk-free rate of interest is 1.2% and our time to expiration is four months, so one-third of a year. Um, then the way we compute the option value is we add up all of the payoffs and we have to account for the zero values. I mean, it's, trivial, it's trivial, but uh, you'll see why in a minute. I mean, we don't actually in the computation have to include them, but we have to be mindful of them. Then we're going to discount back to today using the interest rate and the, um, the time to maturity or to expiration. We use, just use a continuous discount factor. And then we take that value and we, we average by the total number of scenarios. And that gives us our option price, in this case, about six bucks. Okay. But in reality, five scenarios is not going to give us a good value for our option price. And um, in reality, we're typically going to be looking at about um, 10,000, even up to about 100,000 um, scenarios that we need to generate. So as you can imagine, this can lead to rather computationally intensive operations. But the cool thing is, is if you plot it all out, it kind of looks like a Jimi Hendrix album cover. <laughs> okay, so let's impose the same example that we, we used before. So strike price at 105. You can see down here the, the initial price is 100. So um, if we end up above that strike price, then we have to calculate the payoffs of, of all those scenarios. And then at the bottom, they're, they expire worthless. Okay. So um, that's what we need to do. But before we can do anything, we need to first um, generate one scenario. And then once we have that, reusable code, right? We just do it, use the same thing many times. Okay. So um, to do this, um, we will use a stochastic process that you see there. Um, and what these things are, so ST is the, oh, let me back up a second. What we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to take that, um, that time frame from zero to capital T, and we're going to chop it up into little increments, delta T. And this actually comes out of, um, it's called stochastic calculus, but it's, a, it's like calculus. That delta T is an approximation for a differentially small um, amount. Okay. So we're going to chop it up, and then at, at each time step, we're going to generate the next stock price by using this, this formula. This formula falls out of um, the Black-Scholes theory. Um, some of you might be wondering, well, why don't you just use Black-Scholes? We could for this one. Um, but I want to show how to use Monte Carlo pricing. and. There are a lot of options for which there are no closed form solutions. So um, you can use this method for um, more, more complex options. Okay, so um, most of these we take in at, we're gonna write a class called equity price generator. And so we're gonna take in most of these at construction. Um, they'll be stored as, as member variables. So um, pretty self-explanatory except maybe volatility. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's the standard deviation of movements in the stock price. Okay, So we have all that, but um, you may notice there's one term up there, epsilon sub t. And that's what drives the randomness. And what that is, is a draw from a standard normal distribution. And this is where the random feature in C++11 comes in very handy. So. Um, We'll, of course, have to include our header file, but we will also have to include the, the random header so we can use these features. 
Okay. Now, the way it works in C++ is it's a two-step process. First, we need to uh, create an engine object, and what that will do is it will generate um, positive integers that are uniformly distributed. And then we need a distribution object. In this case, it will be the normal distribution, and it will apply a transformation of those integers to standard normal values. And then the next one that's picked is just the next standard, standard normal random draw um, that, that you get. So for this, we need uh, first an engine object. So we will use, there are a number of different engine objects and there are um, a number of different distribution classes in the standard. Um, we will use the Mersenne Twister algorithm, the 64-bit version, and this is the most robust engine available in the standard. So what, uh, and what I commonly used when, or my group used when I worked in the private sector. And then we'll also use the normal distribution, so we need to scope that. Okay. All right, so um, the place where most of the work will be done is, oh, and by the way, all this sample code, not just what you see here, but the entire code, is available on my GitHub site, and I'll give you the URL at the end of the, the presentation. Okay, so um, as you probably know, when we generate a sequence of pseudo-random number uh, variables, or, uh, we need a seed value. So that's what we'll have to take in here in this uh, functor. And we will store, we'll take those generated um, random stock prices, and we'll store them in a vector V, which you see there. All right, so um, this is where the magic starts. So um, we're going to create an, an object called MT Engine. It takes in its constructor the seed value. Um, this, so this is our engine. Um, and then we uh, create an instance of the normal distribution called ND. Um, you might notice that there are no constructor arguments for normal distribution. That's because the default is 0, 1. Um, you might also note there's a default um, template uh, parameter. It's double precision. Okay, so um, the next step is to implement this um, stochastic process. Well, lambda expressions make this very, very easy. And you can basically see how it's, it's been implemented here. I don't think I need to go through all that. Um, but then um, the, the next step would be um, we need to take the current stock price that we see in the market, and that will be our first stock price in the vector for our scenario. So now we have an ST minus 1, and we can start the process. And so that goes on down here in, we're going to iterate through all the, the time steps, and then at each time step, we're going to call the, um, the iterative uh, stochastic process and um, uh, get the next price in the, in the scenario path. Um, so equity price here is the previous equity price, and then to get the, um, the draw from the normal distribution, what we do is we call ND and its functor, and the argument is just the engine object. And so every time you call that, it's going to generate a new pseudo-random number uh, taken from a standard normal distribution. But um, it's important to remember that this is all made possible by um, the, the random feature in C++11. Okay. So um, we now have a class that will generate one random equity scenario. But remember, we need about maybe 10,000 of these things. Okay. So what we're going to do here is, as you might imagine, well, we've got 10,000 of these things. They don't care about each other. So it's very easy to use task-based concurrency, so another uh, feature in C++11. Um, and so if we go back to our five scenario um, example, so each, um, um, each generated path is going to be, is 
going to be a vector of these, these prices. To generate it in parallel, we're going to use, we're going to do that as a task, and that's um, managed by a future object. So the, the future uh, manages creation of that vector, so the vector is in the um, template, uh, it's the template parameter. Okay. Now, assuming that everything runs fine, um, when it's done, then we call get, and that will get each of those individual vectors of random scenarios. But remember, for a European option, all we care about is that last price. So we just call back on the, the vector that we, that we get back from the future object. And then, uh, like before, we're going to discount these back and then take the average to get the price. So let's look at how we might do this. Um, we'll create a class called MC Euro Opt Pricer. Um, we will use the previous result, the equity price generator. Um, just an aside, another nice feature uh, from C11 is enum class, and we can use this to define our option type, whether it's a call or a put. Okay, now if you look at the constructor, um, a lot of those. Um, variables are the same as what we needed for our equity price generator, but there are a few extra that we need for specifically pricing an option. And those are the strike price of the option, the option type, put or call, and then there's quantity. We will just assume one because we're spying an option on one share, but that's if you are, if you're taking a position in more than one. But for our purposes, we'll just, we'll just assume one for simplicity. Okay. Um, then where most of the work will be done is in this last private function, uh, compute price async. And so this is where we'll use task-based concurrency to generate each one of those scenarios. But so that we can compare runtimes, I've also implemented a non-parallel version. And so when we get done with this, we can actually compare how much better we do. Okay. So, um, Again, this, in this function, this is where really the, the bulk of the work is done. Um, we will, first, we need to create an instance of our equity price generator. And now those values, the inputs are, are member variables, so that's done. Um, there's a, we can assume we have a vector of seeds equal to the number of time steps. That's done by this function generate seeds, but each seed is a distinct integer. Okay, so um, since we're going to be using future classes, we need to include the header. Um, and then we're going to have a lot of future objects, so we need a place to store them. Um, use a container, and when in doubt, use a vector. That's what Herb Sutter tells us, so. Um, okay, so um, now we've set it up so that each of these objects will be in a vector, but at this point, nothing has happened. We have to um, give the command to execute each of these tests in parallel. And the way that's done, again, so a lot of you may know this already, but again, I want to show how you can use this to solve a real world problem. So we call std async, and it is going to take in for its inputs the function that is going to run in, in parallel and the argument for that function. So we're just going to use the functor on the um, EPG object. Okay. So um, now at this point, as I'm sure many of you know, there are a lot of nuances, and I don't say a lot, but there are a few, and some things that um, you, know, you might want to consider about using task-based concurrency. But we will assume um, that everything runs fine. Um, we get the, the scenarios are generated in parallel, and we are now in a position to iterate through this vector of futures. And again, like I said, we call the get function on future. That returns the vector. Call back on the vector. That gives us our terminal price. And then we calculate the payoff based on whether it's call or put. Discount it, put it into another vector, and then down at the bottom we compute the average and you see we get the price. Okay, so that's how that works. 
Um, looking at some results, um, this was run on a Hyper-V 20 core virtual machine. Um, this is thanks to a friend of mine who works at Microsoft. But um, in the real world, though, I mean, a virtual machine like this would probably be pretty commonplace now in a, in a quant shot. Um, and you can see our first example, there's really no difference in runtime. So just monthly time steps, uh, one year, 10,000 scenarios. But as we start increasing the number of time steps and scenarios, and then the value of capital T, you can see we start to get you know, some pretty significant um, improvements. And then as we go even farther, we start to converge around 90%. So the upshot here, though, is that we've achieved this with very little effort. It's like I tell my, I tell my students, don't do more work than you have to. And there's all this great stuff now in C++ that makes that possible. Um, but my, my little rant is, is that, again, in the teaching materials and books and so forth, you know, they're, they're still back at, um, you, know, you know, let's do new and delete and um, design our own linked list and things like that. Um, maybe that's good for computer science, but for quantitative development, it's, it's not really that useful. Um, anyway, um, that's, that's really the upshot. That, and we have not had to deal with any manual spawning or killing of threads. So less error prone, more maintainable. And on top of it, it can actually be more efficient. If you don't believe me, um, read Meyer's Effective Modern C++. That's where that little factoid came from. OK. So um, just a couple of other uh, things to note. Um, we used um, the simple case of a European equity option, but Rest assured, there are far more complex options that must be priced in, in practice. Um, some of these, and also some of you might be saying, you know, why in the Sam Hill is he price, pricing a 10-year European stock option? Those don't exist in the market. True, they don't. But a lot of other options do. And some of them are, for example, interest rate and foreign exchange swaptions. Those can go out five, 10 years. Um, hybrid structured derivatives, which also involve interest rates and foreign exchange. Those are really fun to work with. That's where the math gets really interesting. And then there are also um, guaranteed investment products um, that are designed by life insurance companies. And with, they also have a life insurance component with them. But these things can get very, very complex and need to, often need to be projected out 30 years. And um, so, um, believe me, um, it can get a lot more complex, but a lot more fun. Um, and uh, just as, as an aside, this is the kind of stuff that I worked with before I went into teaching. Um, OK. And then, um, as I mentioned, just to recap, there are different types of um, engine algorithms and distributions available in the standard library. So it's not just Mersenne Twister and normal distribution. Um, you know, there, there are others. Um, but for this type of problem, where it's based on what's called the no arbitrage pricing theory and uh, um, Black Scholes theory, you're going to be using standard normal and you want the most robust engine you can find. Okay, so uh, we've gone through kind of the modern C stuff. Um, oh, I, just to recap, so Mersenne Twister is the most robust, and I count um, 17 um, distributions available in the standard library. Um, if you want more information on this, um, I highly recommend Nico Yosudis' standard library book, second edition. It's a great book for teaching. I use it all the time. And back when I was actually in the private sector, I had the first edition I practically carried that thing everywhere, kind of like uh, when I carried a basketball everywhere when I was a kid. OK, so um, moving on, we'll talk a little bit about Boost. As you know, um, Boost is divided up into a lot of different libraries. 
Um, we'll look at some of the math related stuff. One of those libraries is the Boost Math Toolkit. And there are two, shall we say, packages that, that these are all written by different authors. So um, you could arguably call them libraries as well. Um, but two that are very intuitive and very useful are statistical distributions, and that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll probably say probability distributions, and numerical integration. So, um, and then in addition, there are some other libraries outside the mathematical math toolkit, um, and you, you see them here, and we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit. I don't have a lot of time to go into detail, but there is, again, some sample code that you can see um, that I'll provide you at the end. Okay, so um, probability distributions in Boost. So each distribution in this library is a class type. Now, I can probably imagine that some of you are saying, why are you talking about probability distributions in Boost when we have them in the standard library? The answer is, in the standard library, it's for random number generation only. In Boost, what we get are the probability density function, the cumulative distribution function, and the quantile function. But in reality, we really need all four, but I'll, I'll talk about that at the end here. But it's very easy to use. You need to include the necessary, necessary headers with just a couple of examples here with T distribution and the normal distribution. And um, then we can just create the objects very easily. How do we determine a T distribution? Degrees of freedom, right? So students T, D1, four degrees of freedom, done, easy. And basically the same thing for the standard normal um, mean and standard deviation like before. Now, what we're after are the, those functions that I mentioned. And um, the way that they're implemented in Boost is they are generic non-member functions, but extremely easy to use. So you want the PDF? Just say PDF, your distribution object, for example, um, with D1, the T distribution object we created, put PDF D1, value of X at which you want to evaluate it, done, easy. Um, some, same thing for the CDF, and uh, similar for the quantile function, except we replace X with the percentile value. Okay. Um, but this kind of begs a natural question. Um, well, first of all, I count 34 probability distributions in Boost versus 17 in the standard library. So, um, and in addition, the standard library gives us random number generation. Boost gives us the, you know, the usual functions that we need. Now, uh, will we eventually see a union of all of these functions and um, distributions somewhere in the standard library. So for example, in the R language, is everybody, most, most people familiar with R? Yeah? So for math and statistics, for a new distribution to go into either base R or into an approved package, it must include all four. It's required or else it'll be rejected. And um, in practice, we need all four. So it would be nice to have it all in one place and have all 34 distributions and all the functions together. But um, anyway, if uh, anyone's listening. Um, OK, so um, the other one that I really like in, in Boost is numerical integration. There's a package in the toolkit called Quadrature. It actually does both numerical integration and um, differentiation. Um, but it is, it is really, really easy to use. If Suppose you want to calculate an integral using the trapezoid method. Use the trapezoidal function. What does it take as inputs? It takes in the function as either a function object or a lambda. And then the, the limits of integration and you're done. Very easy. There are some additional parameters that have defaults there. I didn't include them. But for if you want to increase the number of iterations or put a different tolerance in, you can. Okay. Now, um, this kind of begs another question. 
what if we wanted to uh, write um, root finding algorithms? Now, these are in Boost, but again, because this is a different author, it's done completely differently from what you see here. And I don't want to you know, offend anyone, but it's far more complex than what you see here. Um, but we could, do, we could do the same thing. And in fact, a student of mine and I, over the summer, we did some prototyping of the um, bisection method and Stephenson's method, and, and we're able to get them to work. We took a few hints from the actual source code for numerical integration and in boost. So again, it's just like that, you're done, and you don't have to set up a lot of stuff, and you, you know how it can be sometimes with some of these libraries. So anyway, there's some exam uh, examples of those in, in the sample code if you want to take a look at them. Okay. So um, to close it out, um, there are three other libraries that I mean uh, that are I found to be quite useful for um, financial modeling. Uh, one is the Circular Buffers library. Uh, this is an STL compliant container. It's much like a stood deck, except that it has a fixed capacity. So it's very, very useful for um, handling live rate feeds, say from Reuters or Bloomberg. So it will fill up to capacity, and then when the next data point comes in, it pops off the oldest one, pushes on the new one, and you know, it's very convenient for that purpose. Um, another one, are the accumulators. These are also STL compliant. Um, they're ideal for managing data columns because they're equipped with the usual descriptive statistics functions like you know, mean, median, max, standard deviation, and so forth. So those, those can be useful too. And then um, finally is multi-array and also STL compliant. Um, it's a templated multi-dimensional array. And one thing it can be very useful for is um, lattice models for option pricing. And to give you an example, I'm, I'm going to show you a binomial lattice for pricing a European option. Okay. Um, and so it looks something like this. It's similar to um, the Monte Carlo method, except the up and down movements are prescribed, and the, the probability is actually prescribed. But it's not arbitrary. It, this also comes out of the Black-Scholes theory. So again, if you were to take all three, you took the Monte Carlo and the, um, this example, they should all converge to the Black-Scholes price. But it's similar in that, let me see if I, there it is. So you can see we go out on the tree, and it's just like you know scenarios in Monte Carlo, and we generate the equity prices. We get to the expiration date, and we then look at the payoffs. So these are out of the money, and these are in the money. And then we use interest rates and the probabilities going back to calculate expected values of the option price at each one of these nodes until we get to our, op our option price here. Now, uh, why, are the, why are these useful? Each one of these nodes is an object. So this is a very simple case going out. You could have a struct that stores the, the equity price going out and the payoffs going back. But again, um, there are much more complex options. And in fact, that, that object you have might be a full class with more calculations that need to be done, along with member functions that do some of those interim calculations. Okay. And the other thing too is like with, with Monte Carlo, you, you, would need, you would need more time steps. Otherwise, it, it's not, it, the conf, you're not really going to converge to anything meaningful. Okay. So, wow, I was uh, worried about not having enough time, but um, we're almost there. Um, so, as you can see down at the bottom, this is from a book called um, Option Theory by Peter James. If you're interested at all in um, this field, I highly recommend this book. I also use it for 
several of my classes um, and also used it in practice. Um, and speaking of references, here are a few more that I used for, um, for this talk. If you would like more information on our program, um, shameless plug, that's our URL. Um, you can also ask me about it if you're interested. Um, we are a, a top 15 program in the country, and we get um, essentially 100% placement of, of graduates. Um, so um, then after that, just to wrap up, here's the um, GitHub address for the sample code. Um, if you'd like to contact me, this is my email address at the university. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. And um, I will also be around all week. So for the rest of the week, well, I say it's almost over. Um, we're at the past the halfway mark now. But anyway, I'll be around the rest of the week. So if you see me, if you'd like to ask any more questions, um, that's fine. Or I, uh, conversely, if you work in this field, I'd like to hear from you. Um, just don't give me any proprietary information because I don't want to go to jail and I don't want you to go to jail. <laughs> so, but anyway, if you see me around in the spirit of leverage, you can uh, leverage, the, leverage a beverage and uh, talk a little shop. So uh, thank you very much for attending. So if, if we, we do have uh, some time for questions. So. Hi, thanks for presenting. Um, so much I see in this field devolves into some form of a matrix and linear algebra. Do you have any recommendations or, for, or suggestions for how to um, work with matrices or linear algebraic libraries that you've used? Thank you. Yeah, um, well the two that I mentioned, Eigen and Armadillo, are, are widely used. I personally prefer Eigen, um, but a lot of people like Armadillo. Um, Eigen, one thing that's nice about it, it's, um, it's all templated, so all you have to do is include the header files, whereas with um, Armadillo, I have run into some problems with the um, linking with some of the libraries in some complex cases where we were interfacing with another language. So, and also the documentation for Eigen is, is really, really good. Does that help? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, a question, uh, can you recommend any good sources on what might be called uh, software engineering best practices specifically targeted toward quants? Um, take my classes. <laughs> They're available online too. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry, shameless plug. Um, well, that kind of gets back to my gripe at the beginning. I'm unable to f really find any decent resources on it. That's why so, I asked. Yeah. I've had the same problem. Yeah, okay, yeah. But if you, I'm happy to share with you lecture notes or anything. Okay. So, you know, just, just drop me a note, say you're the guy who asked, and, you know, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, this is Arindam from Bloomberg. Can I actually go back to the slide where you showed the, the state async? The just, which one? Uh, the, 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 the slide where you have the code, where you're creating the threads. Okay. There. So right here, right? Yeah. Um, where you do create the async, uh, don't you have to specify a, like a launch policy here? Because that's why I said that's why I said there are some subtleties and nuances that I just. I see. Yeah. Because I yes. think I, I just talked to Anthony Williams today, and I think from C plus plus fourteen, this this syntax is invalid. I mean, undefined behavior according to the standard. Uh, okay, I've I've run it on a fourteen and a seventeen compiler, no problem. I see. So. Yeah, it just uh, we but, talked today. But if, but if you have to, you know, if if there's something I can be aware of. You got my email address. So. Cool. Thank you. I'd like to hear about it. Cool. Thank you. Sure. I have a follow-up comment on this slide, especially. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, first question, well, not comment, questions, right? First question, you created like uh, 10,000 or 100,000 threads mm -hmm. in the for loop. Don't you have like a thread congestion on your virtual machine with just 24 cores? Didn't have any problem. And that's what I see is the beauty of task-based concurrency because you don't have to worry about it. I've just never had a problem with it. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, because it doesn't say policy here. Um, then probably comment. When you do the accumulate, uh, well, there is a uh, parallel accumulate, right? Oh, I know. I, I know. I just... Um, okay, and then question out of curiosity. Yeah, if you, you just, in this example, take the latest point, why do you return the whole vector and then just drop all except the last point? Because you need to generate the whole vector in order to get that that last price. Yeah, but it can be just, you know, runtime variable because uh, your uh, your n plus one time point depends on only on nth uh, point. So it's just recursion. Um, I suppose I just found this way to be uh, more straightforward. Um, I, I don't know if they're, what's that? What do you do you mean? Um, you on, mean on your, on your at this point here. Yeah. All I'm doing is I'm getting the the last price. I'm not copying a vector there. No. But but still, there's there's no copy here. Yeah, but you still accumulate. I mean, allocate the whole memory for the whole array. But in principle, you just iterate through the two points. I mean, I suppose you could, but it just mathematically it made a lot of sense to just put the whole thing in, in uh, as vectors. Well, and and it's also just to to show how to use task-based concurrency. I'm sure there's some, you know, a, you know some improvements that, that could be made. Since we're talking about mathematics, I have one more New York comment. Uh, there was a previous slide with the formula, uh, with the iterative formula. Can mm -hmm. you please slide on it? Uh, oh, I go back to that one? Yeah. Uh, not previous, but yeah, used to be some slides. This one? Yeah. Um, so I shouldn't converge to something when you uh, make delta t go closer to the zero. I mean, you're uh, basically defined time that series. Gets in, uh, yes, it does. It 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 converges into the um, into a differential equation, stochastic differential equation is what happens. I see. Uh, maybe I'll ask this offline, but the yeah, square root of delta t concerns me. Yeah, it's just th this is what falls out of the theory when you when you discretize the um, uh, you discretize the formula that you get from stochastic calculus. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Uh, I I hope this isn't out of place, but I'd I'd like to actually comment on the previous questioner's question. I happen to work in a quant group where we are producing data that's used for accounting, public accounting. Uh -huh. And we get audited on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And having things like the entire sequences that you've generated in a Monte Carlo model end up being quite useful in scenarios like that. Because sometimes we're fighting with, you know, one of the big eight or big however many big N accounting sure. firms. And we have to get to the point of giving them a spreadsheet with, okay, this is what our Monte Carlo method generated. And uh, so um, the, the question of how much data you keep somewhat depends on questions of whether you're having to do that type of validation to, to third parties. So I know that's a rare, that's a rare thing in a quant group. No, it's but, not. Oh, um, not. No, because there are lots of uh, regulations that are involved, and that's why it's important. Um, th that's where the seed value comes in. And in fact, when I worked on the, in variable annuities, especially because you've got there, um, you've got FINRA, SEC, um, you've got state insurance, you've got standards of practice by the Society of Actuaries, and you've got very um, other, some of the, the accounting groups like uh, GAP and uh, FAS, and so you have to be able to rep reproduce your results, and so that's a it's actually a very valid comment. 
Okay. So, anything else? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>